All right, now we're going to go to uh, Public Affairs Officer Dan Hewitt in Mission Control, and he has a very special guest, Richard Gorodnik, who is an Ethos Officer, Environmental and uh, Thermal Operating Systems Officer. So, Dan, take it away. Hey, thanks, Michael, and hey, everybody. This is Dan Hewitt in Mission Control, Houston. And like Michael said, I'm joined right now by Richie Gorodnik. He's one of our uh, flight controllers here that helps to make sure our astronauts are always kept safe on safe on board the International Space Station. And you're joining us right now. This really is the nerve center. This is where the International Space Station is flown, controlled, and all the people down here on the ground making sure all the systems are working appropriately. So, Rich, thanks so much for joining me here today. I know they got a lot of great questions, so why don't you guys go ahead and start off. My name is Dorian Dobey, and I wanted to know if the astronauts that are in space can contact their family like they contact mission controls. Absolutely, they can. Uh, they can contact them um, either every night. They have uh, conferences with their family. They have um, private family conferences where it's uh, um, completely isolated from mission control. They can talk to them as many times as they want to. Especially on uh, crew days off, they can also spend a lot more time with them as well. Yeah, I mean, they kind of have. It's almost like a Skype setup where they 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 can talk to their families directly almost any time they want. So it really helps, you know, removing a lot of those feelings of isolation and things like that. That's right. All right, next question. I'm Joseph Edwards, and I wanted to know that, uh, I wanted to know if, since uh, it's an international space station uh, and different countries have to communicate, is foreign language a part of astronaut training, or do they all, or do they all learn English? Another great question. Um, for all the Japanese and the European astronauts, they all speak English. Um, for the Russians, however, most of the time they will speak Russian. Some of them do know English, but uh, we do have translators that are here, both here and in Russia, that uh, help to translate a lot of that communication down. And I know a lot of our astronauts, so, um, all of our astronauts are launch launching on Russian vehicles right now. Part of their mandatory training is they go through Russian um, language courses and they actually go over and live with Russian families while they're training. So. I think really the two main languages are English and Russian right now on board the International Space Station. That's right. All right, next question, guys. Hello, my name is Nicholas Del Valle, and uh, my question is, what are the effects of being in space for such long periods of time, and how do the astronauts, how do the astronauts prevent or live with these effects? Okay. Um, so uh, there are a couple different effects for them living in space for a long time. So remember that there's, since there's uh, very little gravity um, when they're in uh, low Earth orbit, so what they have to do is, is they have to uh, exercise almost every day just because they experience some bone loss when they're there for a long time. We're talking about a, a small amount here, and, uh, but they exercise for hours a day just to make sure that they can combat that. Yeah, I mean, they have like treadmills and weightlifting devices on board the International Space Station. Not like you would think of here because, I mean, with that lack of gravity, you can't really pick up a barbell and start lifting it and have it do anything. That's right. So they have a, they have a couple of different devices, like on a treadmill. They have a harness that actually pushes them down on it as they're exercising. And like Richie said, they're exercising about two hours every single day. So it's, it's quite a lot of work just to stay in shape when you're up in space. All right, next question, guys. Hi, I'm Sharon Thomas. I wanted to know how long does it take to prepare to go into space? And hear that? How long? How does long take? does it take to prepare to go into space? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, each astronaut actually trains for approximately two and a half years after they get into the uh, astronaut candidate program. Um, and that is completely scheduled and regimented out for that entire time, including their vacation and everything else. But uh, they're either training here, they're training in Japan, they're training in Europe, training in Russia. Uh, but it's uh, a really solid schedule for the next two and a half years once they get in that yeah, program. Yeah, I hear they spend a lot of time on the road. Like you said, they're, they're in Japan, they're in Russia, they're in the United States. They're kind of all over the place. And it's two and a half years of prep for up to six months of time in space. So you can almost think of a space flight almost takes up three years of your life. Right. So it's a lot of training because by the time they get up there, they need, they need to be completely familiar with every single system on board the station. So everything just kind of becomes reflex. By the time they get up there, they feel like they've already been there for two years. All right, next question, guys. My name is Michael Wally. I want to know about how long do you have to stay in bed until you reach your destination? 
how long do you have to stay? We didn't quite catch that. Could you ask that one more time, please? I was asking how long do you have to stay in band until you reach your destination? How long do you have to stay in what? I don't know. <laughs> Sounds yeah. like you're saying how long do you stay in bed? Right. <laughs> And I think you meant more in the space capsule they used to get okay. up to the space station. All right. So about uh, about how long? So from when they launch, how long does it take to get to the space station? Right. So like how long they're staying in okay. Soyuz when yeah. they're launching up. Okay. So I mean that'll vary. Uh, usually it only take a couple days, even less. Uh, the the whole idea is that they're what takes a long time is that they have to try and get in orbit with the uh, space station because the, the trip is very short. It's only a couple hundred miles that they have to get up um, because they're launching from Kazakhstan up to the station. So that is very, very short. Uh, but then they have to rendezvous with the station and they uh, and they get in there. So I mean, even a day or less, they're, they're really there. So about two days, less than two days. Yes. All right, next question, guys. My name is Nandita, and um, how is the International Space Station beneficial to the Earth? How is it? Be how is the International Space Station beneficial to the Earth? Ah, I get that question a lot, actually. Um, so, uh, as you might or might not know, the International Space Station does have a lot of uh, cru crucial systems that are on board. But uh, on top of that, they work on experiments every day. So they're working on, you know, hundreds of different uh, experiments that they're conducting that can only really be done in microgravity. And if you look, uh, if you try to look on the web for a lot of the results, they've come up with. Uh, Thousands of patents uh, that are uh, being generated from the uh, from the station, and uh, it continues to produce more and more results that are really beneficial to us on the ground. And I mean, some of the ways, like uh, for example, our astronauts on board the station have a recycling system that takes wastewater, even you know some some of the astronauts' waste, and it recycles everything to potable drinking water. So one of their favorite quotes is, "Today's water could be yesterday's coffee." So something like that could have huge implications in places that are stricken by drought or don't have safe drinking water. That's a technology that we develop just for space that we can then use down here on Earth. All right, next question, guys. My name is Garcia, and I wanted to know if ethos could be used to colonize another planet. I'm sorry, could you speak up a little bit? Uh, my name is Arshia, and I wanted to know if you uh, if ethos could be used to colonize another planet? We heard, yeah, we heard something about colonizing another planet. That's a good question. Um, uh, one more time, real loud, just the first part, real loud. Can ethos be used to colonize another planet? Can ethos, so, could you go colonize another planet? By myself, that would be very difficult to do. Um, I think, in general, uh, for uh, the International Space Station, you know, as part of our efforts to try and colonize another planet, it's possible just because we're able to recycle a lot of our resources. So, when you were talking about uh, transforming, you know, the yesterday's uh, coffee in today's water, it's the same thing. So, you know, the next thing would be maybe to, you know, produce food with, uh, you know, leftover carbon or anything like that. But absolutely, recycling our resources is what could bring us to the next step of uh, colonizing another planet. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the, the space station really is, it's kind of serving as our test bed. So we're still pretty close to Earth. So if anything goes wrong, we can get back. But we're using it to figure out a lot of the different technologies and methods that we would need if we're going to go to a place like Mars or an asteroid or something like that. So we're making the technologies now that we're going to use tomorrow. All right, next question, guys. My name is Brandon, and um, what do you do for free time? Uh, what do the astronauts do for free time? Okay, so although their uh, schedule is pretty regimented throughout the day, they do have uh, time off. They have uh, time where they can either spend with their family, as we talked about before. They can also, uh, you know, watch movies. They can, you know, just stare out the window. They uh, have this one module called the cupola, and they uh, it's this giant uh, view of Earth, and so they can stare down at that. And we find a lot of astronauts actually spend a lot of time looking down at Earth and just kind of relaxing like that. So although their day-to-day -day is, is very regimented with their exercise and with their experiments, things like that, they are spending some time off. All right, next question, guys. Um, my question is, do, do 
Do your organs function differently in space? So this was actually thought of a lot uh, during the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs where the medical community didn't believe that uh, astronauts could really survive in space. But as it turns out, uh, you know, all of the organ function is almost exactly the same. As we talked about before, there was some uh, small bone loss that occurs, but that's why they try to combat it with exercise. But other than that, uh, bodily function is actually almost very similar to what it is on Earth. All right, next question, guys. That was a good one. Hi, my name is Nicole Williams, and I was wondering if, have y'all ever had any emergency situations on the ISS, and if so, how did you fix it? So if we had any emergencies on ISS, thankfully we have not had any real emergency on the International Space Station. However, that's something that uh, I deal with a lot in training, is trying to deal with the three big emergencies, which is your fire, your rapid depress, and uh, toxic atmosphere. And what's rapid depress so real quick? So a rapid depress is when if you have like, uh, you know, a hole in the station or something like that from like a small meteor hitting it or, you know, any anywhere where you're losing pressure from the station at a very mm -hmm. fast rate. Uh, so what we try to do is we try to isolate that and maybe patch it up if it's small enough. And the same thing with the toxic atmosphere. If there's ammonia that goes into the cabin or anything else that's a spill or something, that can really be considered an emergency event. But thankfully, we have not had any emergencies on ISS, but we are prepared in case any of them were to happen. That's right. These these guys here at Mission Control train very extensively, probably just as much, if not more, than these astronauts just to get ready to handle because everyone in this room is really controlling most of the stuff on board the International Space Station. So if something were to happen, they're the ones responsible for making sure everything turns out okay. That's so right. they're, they're, they're very ready and they're very prepared. All right, next question. Um, my name is Nani Venkit, and I was wondering what kind of research is conducted on the International Space Station. What kind of research is conducted on board the International Space Station? So there is a multitude of research that's uh, being done on the space station where it comes to uh, if they're trying to use combustion products or they're trying to, you know, figure out how uh, insects survive in space or they're trying to figure out, you know, all kinds of things that they're trying to take advantage of the fact that they're in this microgravity uh, environment. But uh, if you look on the web, there, there are thousands of them that are being done at the same time. I can't even start to think of you know, really what they're what they're working on. Yeah, just some of the stuff that uh, we were just taking a look inside the International Space Station. This is a live view of our, our NASA astronaut, Joe Acaba, and he was doing some combustion experiments, so he was basically lighting things on fire earlier today, and they're just trying to figure out, because fire reacts very differently when you don't have gravity down here on Earth. So our scientists are finding out how it reacts and how they can, you know, suppress any fires. Um, they do a lot of biomedical experiments looking at how the body reacts to microgravity and also different things like stress and closed environments and diets and things like that. And then there's materials. There's There, there really are thousands of studies that take place on board the station. All right, next question, guys. How do, you, um, how do the astronauts sleep in zero gravity? How do they sleep? Okay, so that's another good question. In, uh, in one of the modules that's called Node 2, what they do is they have these areas called the crew quarters, and uh, it's this kind of padded room where they're able to you know, stand up, they can strap themselves to the wall, they have a fan that's in there, and surprisingly, they, uh, they find it very comfortable to be in that area. So you'd think you, know, you need to be laying down, you need to be in a bed, something like that, but those crew quarters are designed specifically for the astronauts to be able to sleep, and they sleep you know, almost eight hours every single night. Absolutely. And they, I mean, even back on the shuttle when you don't really have your own little crew quarter, they usually strap themselves down because, I mean, when you're in that microgravity environment, when you're, you're sleeping, you could just float off and start bumping into things. Right. So they kind of have like these sleeping bags that they can crawl into and strap themselves to a wall or something. So you, you, you don't really get that sensation of laying down, but you can kind of stay in one place and make sure you don't float off and bump your head on something while you're sleeping. All right, next question, guys. That was the last question from our students, but my name is Tony Williams. I'm the program manager for the STEM program. So I have a question in regards to emergency situations with the crew. Have you had any, and if you do, how do you handle it? Any emergency situations with the crew? Have we had any? With the crew on the ISS? Mm -hmm. So you're just talking <laughs> emergencies with the crew members. Could be medical, things like that. So as far as I know of, there haven't been any that have been classified exactly as an emergency situation. We have had a couple uh, minor things that have happened with the crew, but it's really 
you know, very small things that have happened. Certainly nothing that would be constituted as an emergency, um, which is which is we're very thankful for for happening. So. And I mean, in case of and we we always plan for you know any scenario possible. So, let's say there's a medical emergency with one of the crew members on board. Um, each of the crew members, as part of their training, gets some proficiency as a medical officer, and then there are always uh, flight surgeons, so people down here on the ground that can walk through the other crew members through any necessary treatment or things like that. And that's actually uh, another one of the technologies that NASA is proving on board the Inter International Space Station, and that's telemedicine. They do regular checkups and things like that with the crew members, and it's all, you know, from people down here on the ground few hundred or a few thousand miles away depending on where the station is um, with these astronauts up in space and that's had direct implications in uh, providing medicine to places in uh, fairly isolated locations that may not have uh, the you know doctors and people with the real technical knowledge but you have patients that have a need for that you can then have your doctors use what's called telemedicine, so basically video, audio communications to then treat people from a remote location. So that would pretty much be how we handle any emergency situations with crew members on board the station. Any other questions from anybody else? Any other questions? Let's go. Take about three more questions. Line up. Let's go. <coughs> three more questions. One, two, three. Hello again, my name is Nicholas Devine. My question is, um, would the ISS uh, soon or in the near future be used as a transit hub for spacecraft um, trying to discover new places or new substances? It sounds like you want to know if it's going to be like the Enterprise from Star Trek. Kind of. is, is the ISS going to be used to discover new places? Well, it does have uh, the ability to uh, thrust to different areas, but we're talking about very small reboosts and things like that. Unfortunately, it wasn't built really to uh, explore another area just because of its, uh, you know, the kind of uh, thrusters that are on the side. But there's always the capability that if we built any other ship in space or anything and we use the ISS to do so, that it's a possibility that we can go to other places. And, I mean, your large future spacecraft are going to have things a lot like what the astronauts live in on board the International Space Station, kind of like these habitation modules. So, like, when we eventually send people to Mars, they'll have big rockets that send cargo and things like that there, but you'll also have these kind of modules that just look like big pods that the astronauts will live in on their journey out there, and those will look very similar to what's on board the station right now. All right, next question. Uh, yes, my name is Kahana Washington. I wanted to know about the new substances that they find on their missions. New substance, new substances that they find in their missions. Hmm. That's a good question. They're not really um, out exploring, you know, far off planets or anything like that. So they aren't really discovering new things. They're discovering how substances that we already know of react differently in microgravity. Like a little while ago, I talked about how Joe Acaba was lighting things on fire earlier today just to see how different fuel samples burn and then react in microgravity. They also do uh, different work with different uh, material substances, um, bio biological substances, uh, things like uh, bacteria and enzymes react very differently in microgravity. Uh, for example, we've been working on developing a um, vaccine to food poisoning, salmonella. So if any of you have had food poisoning before, you know just how awesome that would be to have a vaccine that would prevent that. So we aren't really discovering anything new, but we're discovering how substances we already know about, how they react differently, and what more we can learn about them. All right, next question. Um, I'm Patty Song. And about the food on board, um, is there like any differences with the food here? I know it's all freeze dried, but it sounds kind of different. <coughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> 
Okay, that's uh, another good question. So as far as space food goes, you'll find that a lot of it is actually almost exactly the same that it is on Earth. The only difference is, is that it comes up actually completely dehydrated, and they have to uh, go to the potable water dispenser, and they have to try and hydrate that, uh, that food so they can eat it. And another thing that they find is that a lot of the food is actually very bland when they're up there, so they have to be able to add spices and things like that. One of the favorite foods that astronauts actually enjoy a lot now is shrimp cocktail, so they really... Uh, like having that, you know, that extra sauce, and they like having uh, mm -hmm. certain things that can really activate their taste buds. But you'll find a lot of the food is exactly the same. Yeah, I mean, they, um, our food scientists here at the Jonathan Space Center will actually go and buy a lot of the food that's flown up there just at local grocery stores. But they have to do research and process the food and package it, and like you said, freeze dry it, dehydrate it, so they can uh, preserve it for long periods of time on board the station. All right, any more questions? I think that is it for us. Um, on behalf of the students here at the STEM Acceleration Experience Program, we want to thank you for your time. And let's give them a round of applause. All right, well, thank you guys. Those are some fantastic questions. Thank you with the information that you've given us and has enhanced our young people's knowledge in regards to space. So again, thank you very much. All right. Well, we always we always love taking questions. Thanks for coming in and visiting us here in Mission Control. Rich, thanks for coming on and answering some questions with me. Thanks for having me. Real pleasure. All right, guys. Stay in school. Stick to math and science. You'll be astronauts someday very soon. <laughs>